All right, thank you very much. So, so now in this uh, second part, so I will formulate the relativity kinetic theory for a simple collision with gas. So those are nothing new here. So no new results, but what I, and what I hope to show you is how to you can exploit these geometric structures I've just described to give you a nice physical interpretation of the one particle distribution function. Okay, and then on the way, I mean, by doing that, we also define what are the physical uh, or the macroscopic observables, so that's what the space times of is what they actually measure uh, from, from this. And then here, Hawking just drew my attention that I should call this the Einstein Vlasov system because the Einstein equations are harder to solve than the Vlasov equation. Um, so maybe I will change this. Um, uh, and so, so we'll just mention the system briefly, and then I will tell you how to do the formulation for, for a charged gas involving different species of particles. All right, so, so we will start with um, a simple uncharged gas. So, so, so we'll look at a, an ensemble of identical classical, so non-quantum, uh, non-spinning, Massive free falling particles, so, so there are so there are no collisions, uh, and they, they move as test particles in in, a, in MG. Okay, and and um, uh, and so we, we should so so then we describe the state of this gas as a one particle distribution function. So through this uh, a function f on the future mass shell, which is non-negative. Um, uh, and we should think of this. So somehow we would like to think of it like measuring the state of this of this uh, Gibbs ensemble of of, uh, of particles. Okay, but but how should we how how should this work uh, precisely? And okay, what what we have in mind here as I so, so it's not just a gas in a box like is usually done in statistical physics, but Again, we're interested in things that act like making an accretion flow around the black holes so where the gravitational field is, is strong. So then uh, this geometric thing I said, they become appreciated here. All right, all right. so to, to, to explain what I'm going to do, so we'll start with an analogy. Uh, so instead of describing a kinetic gas, uh, let's think first of a, of a perfect fluid the perfect fluid flow, which is characterized by a four velocity vector u, which is normalized, and the particle density n. Um, and then we take a three dimensional space like hypersurface S in the space time, which is with a future direct normal vector a, little s, say. And you can think of this hypersurface if you want as of a volume at some given time, okay, because it's a hypersurface in the space time. So you can think of it like a volume at some, some time. Now, the, if you want to compute the number, number of particles that it is contained in S, then the answer is you compute this, this flex integral, okay? So you, you compute the integral of S and then you take the product of G with the normal vector to, to S and you take the induced volume form on, on S induced by the space-time metric, okay? And J here, is the particle density times the four velocity. Okay, and you put the minus here so that you get a positive answer if J and S are both future directed time like. Okay, so, so that's like the, the geometric way of, of uh, defining this. Now, of course, if U is hypersurface orthogonal, so if you have no vorticity in your, your flow and S is chosen orthogonal to U, then you just get the this reduces to the usual expression. So n is the integral over the particle density times the induced uh, volume form. So it's just the integral of the particle density. However, in general, of, uh, n should be thought as a flux integral, okay? So, because if u is not hypersurface orthogonal, then this, you, you cannot even choose s orthogonal to u. Okay, and then of course, you know that by I mean, because J has a divergence zero, so that implies that the, the, the particle, cons uh, particle conservation, right, by via Gauss theorem. So if you take two, so say you have a globally hyperbolic space time, which is asymptotically flat, and N vanishes sufficiently fast at infinity, then 
you take two Cauchy surfaces, then you can show that n of s1 is n of s2. So this is the, the conservation of the total number of, of particles. Okay, and now what we want to do is do something similar, but on, on phase space. So instead of space time, we are going up to the future mass shell. Uh, and okay, what I'm going to, to tell you is assuming that the mass is positive of the particles. Uh, so you can define a seven velocity here and you simply take the UV vector field and remember the, uh, if you measure the length of L with the Sasaki metric, that's minus M squared. So divide this by M. So you get this normalized, this uh, seven velocity if you want. Note that this also defines your time orientation on gamma M plus. Okay, and furthermore, recall what is nice to notice also by the propositions I showed you before, you know that this flow is geodesic and it is also volume preserving because of Liouville theorem, okay? So that will uh, describe incompressible geodesic flow on, on phase space, okay? So the, like we, like in the, so that's the Newtonian, uh, well, the, the general relativistic generalization of the Liouville theorem if you want. All right, and now, uh, what is the distribution function describing? So, so multiply the seven velocity with F. So F plays the same role as the particle density. So you get now a seven current. Uh, and uh, now given a six dimensional surface sigma, which you can think of like transverse to J if you want, then you can complex the, the flux Okay, so you can complete the, the, this flux integral. So it's the same flux integral as before. Uh, so minus, so, so here you have the product of J with the normal vector and the, here the induced volume form uh, on this surface sigma. Okay, and the, here I put again a minus so that you get a positive answer if J and U are both, to guarantee that you get a positive answer if J and U are both future directed. Uh, Another interpretation of this n is that this is the ensemble average number of occupied trajectories across sigma. Okay, so you have this hypersurface sigma. You have uh, like trajectories that are crossing sigma, which are the trajectories, the orbits of the UV flow, if you want, if you want to. Okay, and now what this flux integral will tell you is uh, how much occupied trajectories are there, essentially. Okay, as, as before, this integral will reduce to something like the integral of the distribution function if u was orthogonal to sigma. But now u is definitely non, I mean, is definitely not hypersurface orthogonal because recall that the vector, uh, the covector dual to L is the Poincare one form and uh, the Frobenius condition will not be satisfied. So this is this, this, this thing here. Okay, so, so again, the, the, this, this red thing is just to, to tell you, you should think of it as a, as a flux integral, not, not a volume integral of a sigma, okay? All right, so, so that's the, the definition, if you want, or the, the physical interpretation of the distribution function. So it plays essentially the same role as the density, the particle density in the fluid case, uh, only now instead of measuring particles, it may, well, it measures occupied trajectories. Now, to bring this down to space-time, we're going to focus now on a particular case. So instead of taking an arbitrary, a completely arbitrary six-dimensional, I mean, surface in the future mass shell, we are going to focus on ones that have this, this particular form. So we take, again, a three-dimensional space like hypersurface in the space-time that we, and we should think of it like a volume at some given time. So here's a sketch. So this is a space-time manifold. This is this uh, three-dimensional hypersurface S with the normal vector little s. Okay, and now we add to, to each point of S uh, the momentum uh, in the future mass hyperboloid. Okay, and that gives you me a six-dimensional surface in the future mass shell. Um, okay, and, and now what 
So, 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 so this is indicated here. So this is the future mass shell, and then you get this six-dimensional surface here. So I've suppressed many dimensions. And now here, these red lines are the orbits, if you went of the Liouville vector field. Okay, so what, what this n of sigma measures then is the average number of occupied trajectories that uh, cross sigma. But in the space-time picture, this actually the, is the number of particles that are contained in the volume S, this volume S, okay? Because if you project this, this down, then basically this is counting how many particles do we have in, in S. Okay, now let's compute this flux integral. So to, to do this, you need to do the next exercise. So it's the, the exercise to compute now the normal vector of sigma in sigma m plus. Uh, and you can, you can actually show that this is, uh, is horizontal and the, the components here are the same components as, as s. Yeah, so this s mu d by dx mu. And now if you compute this product, so remember we have to compute this, this product here to compute the flux integral. So j is f over ml. And now you have l nu. This you can compute with the Sasaki metric. But l, both are horizontal. So this is just p that is acting on s. And what is induced uh, volume form? So, so this you can compute also. This is will give you this expression. So this in the induced volume form on S times d vol xp, the Lorentz invariant volume element. Uh, and you use this for Bini uh, identity I told you before. And now what you get is integral over p of f of x of p, p of s times omega s. Okay, so you get this, this integral. And, and again, this is now counting how many particles you have in S. All right, so, uh, so let's remember this formula for, for some time. But, but first, let me tell you, uh, if you go, uh, if you assume that in some coordinate chart, you can parameterize this surface by x0 is equal constant, then you can, show us an exercise. So, so this expression is actually this simple integral. So it's actually the integral over f over d free p, d free x. Okay, where p0 here should be determined by p1, p2, and p3, such that p mu dx mu is in the future mass shell. Okay, so, so this is actually just a Newtonian expression for counting particles uh, if you have the one particle distribution. Okay, so that makes contact with the Newtonian interpretation of the distribution function. And actually there are also uh, articles on special relativistic or even general relativistic kinetic theory where they start like by saying, by defining F in this way and then showing a posteriori that this is covariant and so on, okay? So here we don't need to do that because everything is defined geometrically from the very beginning. Okay, now, uh, let's come back, let's come back to this formula and let's do something else. So if I look at this inner integral, so we integrate over P and so we get, um, if, uh, so, 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 so we see here that we have something that looks like a covector field. If I, so S, this is dotted with S, which is a normal vector of gamma S. So what I can do, I can rewrite, uh, if I introduce, this covector field here. So gx of y is just the integral of the fiber of f of x of p of p of y dvol p. Okay, so integrate over p, so this still depends on x and this defines, so this linear in y, so this defines a one form on the, I mean, a covector on, on, at x in the space time. Okay, and now if, if you remember, if we compare this, so remember this describes the number of particles contained in s and if, we remember the fluid analog, then we see this is just a flux integral of S over the particle current density. Okay, so this is, so, so this gives me the right to call this the, the, the particle current density uh, associated now to this kinetic gas. Okay, so in local coordinates, if I went, I can uh, put, compute this component. So I just put y is d by dx mu, and that gives me the, the covariant component of j mu. And 
there's and, and now like in the in the fluid case i can recover n and mu uh, just i mean a covariant way uh, by n is just the um this is just uh, the norm of j mu and u mu the so the this mean for velocity of the gas now will be j mu divided by n so it's just so it's a unit okay you can show easily that this is uh, if, if f is positive, this is uh, future directly time-like, so this formula makes sense. If f is zero, then this is just zero and f shouldn't be negative. Now, more generally, you can also, you can generalize this formula and now define this S symmetric tensor. So you have, you put S vectors back here, and then you, instead of having P of Y, you have P Y one, P Y two, and so, and so on. So you can introduce these S moments of the distribution function. And here comes uh, an important result now. So that's this uh, proposition. So this S moments TS satisfy the following identity. So if you take the divergence of T, um, it's symmetric, so it doesn't matter on which index you take it. So this is a fiber integral where you have here the Liouville vector field acting on F times and here you have p mu 2 and t p mu s okay so this is a very important identity and you can improve it in different ways so one proof is based on gauss theorem and applying this identity here okay so you so you play with this identity and what i told you uh, so this if you want the more elegant geometric proof and and you apply so so you have these identities so, so the flux integral over this current in seven in the seven dimensional phase space is the same as the this flux integral in space time over the current density and actually you can convince yourself this is still true this is even true if s is not necessarily space like so you take s now as the boundary of a compact region in m for example and you apply gauss theorem on both sides to convert this in volume integrals and then you will have here the divergence of J in, in, uh, in, in, in phase space, okay? But that's the divergence of F over M L A. And now you, and then now here comes the Liouville theorem, okay? So here the Liouville vector, the Liouville theorem is important. So the Liouville te theorem tells you that L is divergence free. Okay, and then, so the diversion of this goes away and then what remains is one over M L that is acting on F. So this gives you this side, and here you do the same thing. So you do use Gauss theorem and convert this into a volume integral over the divergence of J. And now, since this holds for any K, so the divergence of J will be equal to this, this integral here. So that proves this identity for S is equal one. And once you have this for S equal one, it's easy to generalize it to, to any S. The other proof that are usually presented in books because it's maybe uh, uh, simpler is you introduce Gaussian local coordinates. So you fix an event X and then you introduce Gaussian local coordinates. So, so the tetrad is trivial there. And the derivative is zero at that point. The derivative of the metric components is also zero. And then you just write out explicitly what this volume form is. Um, here you can put hats or not. It's the same thing because you have a the point x or in the vicinity of a point x so and then you you can just pass this derivative but so the Christoffel symbols are zero because of the Gaussian system so you just pass this derivative inside the integral this integral over p and then you get this so from this you you, you don't get any contribution because this is just p uh, and now you notice that this is again in this Gaussian local coordinate system this is a Liouville vector field and, and now you're done. So this is more direct and e easier, but, but the one is more, more elegant. Okay, so you have this identity. Here's another exercise. So, so if we take S equal two, that's um, here, S equal two, so just two vectors. So that's a symmetric tensor and that's called, that's the stress energy tensor or the energy momentum stress tensor. Uh, and the exercise consists in showing that this satisfies automatically all the standard energy conditions, so the strong, the dominance, the weak, and the null energy condition, if F is 
is positive. So, so this is a, a nice matter field in this sense, if you want that this uh, energy conditions are satisfied automatically. All right, now let me give you an, an example of a distribution function, and that's one of the most important example. Uh, it's what is called a Jutner distribution function. So that's the general relativistic or the relativistic generalization, say, of the of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution function. Okay, and then this is just you can write it. It's just so, so there is a function alpha here. There is exponential p to the beta, and beta is a future directed time-like vector field. Okay, so so you can write also this way here. All right, so, so, so p is also future direct time like so beta mu p mu is actually negative. So, uh, and this is important so that you can, these integrals converge that I showed you before. Okay, now you can compute the S moments using tricks from statistical mechanics. So you introduce this generating function Z, which is just the integral over the distribution function. And then, by formally taking derivatives of beta mu, so you should think of that x is fixed. So beta mu is a fixed vector, and then you partially differentiate it several times by beta mu, and that will give you uh, this uh, t mu, this this um, s moment tensor. Okay, because every time you derive with respect to beta, a p mu will come down. Okay, and that that will give you the components of this s tensor. Now you can do this computation um, by exploiting the easily by exploiting the Lorentz invariant. So we'll introduce an orthonormal frame at x. So we fix x and we orient this frame such that beta, so, so that E naught is aligned with beta. And then P you can write it this way on the so P should be in the future mass shell. So you can introduce no um, hyperbolic angle and, and then a direction on S2. And then you plug this into this, this integral. And then what you get uh, is an expression that you can write in terms of what is called modified Bessel functions of the second kind. So these are just these functions here, which depends on Z and are labeled by nu. Nu should be larger than minus one half and Z positive. So, this is, so these are tabulated special functions. And then this generator is, is given by this expression. Z here is M times the norm of B, beta. That's I, uh, what I mentioned. Okay, and then you compute the first two moments. So for, for J mu, you, get, you can write in this way, N times mu. So N is this expression here. And T mu nu, you can decompose in this way. So you see this U here, that is the direction of J mu, is a time-like eigenvector of, of T mu nu, if you raise one index. So that has the same form as a, and, and, and actually, and, and in the direction of orthogonal to U, that's isotropic. So that's a perfect fluid um, configuration. And you can, well, the, the, the four velocity will just be beta mu normalized. And then H here will be the specific enthalpy and P the pressure. And they all depend on, on Z, on this parameter Z. Uh, and Z, you can, you, you can associate with temperature. If you notice that if you divide P by N, you get M over Z. And now uh, it looks formally like the ideal gas equation, if that would be KBT. So that motivates the definition of T should be one over KB beta, so one over beta, basically. Uh, so I should stress uh, a few things. So, 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 so this is it's a, an, an important example, but still uh, some things to understand about it. So, so, so first, the definition of the temperature is still formal. Okay, uh, it will be clear in the fourth part of the course. So, but but actually, when we will see that this describes a local thermodynamic equilibrium state. And also here, this F has been specified completely by hand. So we don't know yet what F, what equation F is satisfying. 
Okay, and that's actually an non-trivial non question. So, so, so you see that in principle, you can recover a perfect fluid configuration, but there's a warning here, a loud warning that F, we, we don't know yet what F should satisfy. Okay, so let's finish this example. And now let's come to this question, what equation should F satisfy? Uh, what should it be obey? And to answer this, what we are going to, we're going to take now again a, a six dimensional hypersurface in, in, the, in the mass shell, the future mass shell. And we are going to do the following. So, so we look at the flow sigma t of this current j, okay? So which is proportional to the Uvil vector field, if you remember. And then we are going to let this sigma zero flow along these lines until some time delta t. And that will give me a surface sigma one. And we are looking at this tubular region, this cylinder, if you want. Okay. And uh, we're going to, to compare the number of particles or the number, sorry, the number of occupied trajectories here and here and look at the difference. And since these are flux integrals and since the flux of J over the cylinder is zero because the J is tangent to, is orthogonal to the normal, Vector. So you can use Gauss theorem and convert this into the divergence of J, a volume integral over the, uh, the divergence of J. But remember the divergence of J using Liouville theorem is just one over M L that is acting on F. Okay, and now uh, if you look at the collisionless gas, so if there are no collision, then of course the number of occupied trajectories here should match the number of occupied tra trajectories here. So, so these two things should be equal and that should be zero, okay? And that's valid for any sigma zero. You can place your sigma zero where you want. And that implies then that L of F should be zero. Okay, now that there's a subtle point here. So you, I mean, there's a quick argument that says, well, the F is a distribution function and describes somehow the number of, uh, um, I mean, if there are no collisions, then L, you apply L, L on it, and then this should just be constant along L. But, but really, if you, if you look at it carefully, uh, we, we could reach this conclusion because thanks to Liouville's theorem, okay? So, so we, we need also that the divergence of L is zero. Otherwise, this would not be, not be true. Yes? That is... If, if you use m equal to zero, what would they can? Yeah, I don't know. Yes, so, so uh, I, I, yeah, I've been from the very beginning, I always had my mind that m should be positive. So, so if you have another gas, then yeah, all, all these things should be changed. It doesn't apply to, a, to, a, to the zero mass case. Also, the results is, is I think, still correct, but not, not, not with this flexible formulation. All right, so, and then, okay. And then you, you have this, so you can write this equation now explicitly. Uh, here's the next exercise. So, so, so this is the expression that we got in this local coordinates on the cotangent bundle. But if you work on the future mass shell, then P0 is really a derived quantity. So really the, the local coordinates there are X0, X1, X2, X3, and P1, P2, P3. And P0 you, you get from, from this condition here. Now you can show that, I mean, that's the exercise. So, so if you, we know on the other hand that L is also tangent to the mass shell. So it should be also, we should be able to write it in terms of these coordinates here. And this is the, the answer here. So again, here assume that you, you write in terms of an orthogonal frame, uh, but you, you can, you, you can probably also do it without assuming that you assume, without assuming a thermal frame. It's just a little bit easier to do the calculations. All right, and the, the, the Einstein, oh, here I put Einstein Vlasov, so, <laughs> I mean, okay. So, okay, so the Einstein Vlasov system then is just, I mean, you, if, if you want to take into account the self gravity of the gas, then the metric is not fixed anymore, but, uh, it should satisfy Einstein's field equations. And here you couple this to T mu nu, which is just the, the two moment I mentioned you before. 
Now, the, there's an integra integrability condition here, of course, because we know from the Bianchi identities that the divergence of G mu nu is zero. Uh, and, but now, if I go back to the proposition seven, you see this identity, now this comes in here, okay? So, so, so we see if I compute the divergence of T mu nu, then we see if the, if the Vlasov equation is satisfied and this is zero. Okay, so T mu nu will automatically be divergence free. In other words, the Vlasov equation guarantees that the integrality condition for the Einstein equation is satisfied. Okay, and then, then there's been a lot of very encouraging progress on mathematical relativity on these uh, systems or local well posed has been shown as there have even been global nonlinear stability results from Minkowski and also expanding universe and existence of speculative station asymmetric solutions, etc. But I'm not qualified to, to talk about this. So, but uh, Hawk and Andreasen wrote a nice living review about it a few years ago. We can find most of these developments. Okay, so um, in the last few minutes, let me uh, quickly walk you through what you should change. Now, if you want to take uh, gas particles that are charged, okay, in the charge case. So what, what changes here? Okay, and, and that's important actually, if you want to describe the things I mentioned in the motivation, then so that the astronomers, they, they I mean, when jets are produced and in these things like that, the magnetic field seems to play a very important role. So you cannot get away if, if you put the electromagnetic field to zero. Okay, so so this is uh, also something highly relevant. Now, when when so the two things happen basically when the particles are charged, or well, when is the consequence of the other? Maybe so if the particles are charged and they move, uh, uh, then they will produce an electromagnetic field. And now the presence of this very electromagnetic field will deviate the trajectory of these particles. So they won't follow geodesics of space time anymore. Okay, so the Liouville vector field, as I defined it before, is certainly not appropriate now because it doesn't take into account the Lorentz force. Okay, and what you have to do is just remember Hamiltonian mechanics from your electromagnetic course. So uh, when you have so, so let's assume, let, let's start with the simpler case where the electromagnetic fields, you think of the electromagnetic field like a fixed background field, so, so a fixed background two form, uh, which is closed. Um, now, from, from, from your course in, in electrodynamics, so maybe you remember that you can couple the electromagnetic field to, to the particles by in your Hamiltonian, so you, you simply, you rewrite your physical momentum as the canonical momentum pi minus Q times A, where A is electromagnetic potential. So, so A is such as dA is F. Okay, so, so, but if you're Hamiltonian, you take your Hamiltonian, you make this replacement and then you treat pi as a canonical momentum, then you, you get the correct equation of motions. Now, Accordingly, what this means, if the, the symplectic form is d times the canonical momentum that wedge dx mu, now if I rewrite this in terms of p, in terms of the physical momentum, so that will be dp mu wedge dx mu plus q half f nu nu dx mu dx nu. So you see that you can, what you can, you can do, and that's what we are going to do, we, we, are, we are going to choose to still work with the physical momentum, not the canonical momentum. Uh, so, so remember, we have the advantage of working with geometry, so it's, it's ir ir irrelevant at the end what coordinates we, we choose to, to describe things, okay? But, uh, but you see the symplectic form should have this form if P is a physical momentum. Uh, and that's what you're going to do. So, so, so you see this is a nice expression that doesn't depend on the gauge and so on. Uh, so, so, so the canonical momentum is gauge dependent because of, of A and, and um, but, but this symplectic form written this way is, is gauge independent, okay? So, so the definitions of what you do in the charge case, you actually don't change the Hamiltonian, the free particle Hamiltonian, but what you change is symplectic form. Okay, so remember the, the Hamiltonian vector field at the end depends on the Hamiltonian, but also on the symplectic structure. And 
Here it seems appropriate when you go to the charge case to leave the Hamiltonian at this, at, as it is, but you change the definition of the symplectic form. So you add to the symplectic form you had before Q times the pullback of F respect to the projection map and written in coordinates. So that's exactly what we, we have here. So the so omega is still closed if you do this because by Maxwell's equations, DF is, DF is zero uh, because of the homogeneous Maxwell equations that you want to impose, of course. Uh, and you can also show that it's still non-degenerates, okay? So if you if we take the inner product of uh, this with an uh, arbitrary vector field X, then you get this expression here. So before this is a new term here, but in any case, this is zero only if X is zero and Y is zero. So this is certainly non-degenerate. And as I said before, the one particle Hamiltonian, I mean, the, the, the Hamilton is the same as before. Maybe you shouldn't call it free particle Hamiltonian now, but, but really it's, a, it's, a, it's the same as before. Uh, so that's what I just said before. And okay, if I want it, I could go in a special chart. I could introduce this electromagnetic potential and then it could replace P by pi. And then if I write the symplectic form in terms of these coordinates, I will get back the standard form of the uh, symplectic, uh, symplectic form. That is what is called Darboux coordinates. So I could do this at least locally, but um, it's, uh, if I want to work globally, it's preferable to, to use this formulation. Uh, uh, that's actually not something that we invented ourselves. So we notice in the literature that uh, this is something that seems to be known all right, now you compute now the, the new Liouville vector field. So, so the Hamiltonian vector field associated to, to H, but now with this new symplectic form. And now what happens is that it acquires a vertical component. So, so the Liouville vector field, it's called LF with the electromagnetic field is L plus V. So L is the same as before, but V now is this uh, vertical, this vertical uh, vector. Um, and one can verify, you now if you redo the exercise I told you before, so to project the integral curves on the space-time manifold, you can check that this satisfies the correct equations of motion with the Lorentz force. This is the next exercise. So the Sasaki metric and the, the mass shell, we, we don't want to change. So this, we, we keep this exactly the same as it was before. Uh, LF is still tangent to the future mass shell because uh, the mass shell is still a level set of the Hamiltonian. Okay, and, and you, you can show that uh, because of the Hamilton st structure, so LF is still, still preserves the, 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 now the new symplectic structure. Okay, just with the same argument as before. You can show that this formula that I had before to compute the volume form on the cotangent bundle induced by a Sasaki metric, you can replace omega s by omega s comma f. So this, in other words, this, um, so this, this new part that we got, oops. So this, this new part, when, 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 you, when you wedge this four times, this will al always hit another dx, and then they, this will al always go away, okay? So this part doesn't, doesn't modify this formula. Okay, and now if you remember, you can, so, so that was important or useful to prove Liouville theorem. So this almost, this immediately gives you Liouville theorem on the cotangent bundle. And you can also show from this the Liouville theorem on the mass shell. So here, if you remember, you had to compute this lead derivative here of the normal vector field, which is the same as before. And here you get an extra term, but you can show that this extra term actually is identically zero. So again, you 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 can you have you will I mean you will theorem so also, also this LF uh, in, generates an incompressible flow uh, on the mass shell. All right, and now the same thing for the physical I mean for the interpretation of the distribution functions. So there you just change everywhere L with LF in the definition of the current, uh, uh, the, 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 the current density, I mean, on, on the phase space. 
oh, you have this vertical component now, uh, and now you get a new N, which I call NF, and that could very uh, worry you because you, you might get a new, now another interpretation of the distribution function might depend on what, if you have an electromagnetic field or not. But actually you see if, if uh, I mean, if this normal vector field is horizontal, then it doesn't matter because uh, the vertical piece here will just just be zero. Okay, so so for any hypersurface where nu is horizontal, then this you you, you get the same answer as, as before. And in particular, that's true for these particular hypersurfaces where induced by a space like or any hypersurface actually in space time of this particular form. So they had if you remember the normal vector was horizontal. So in all these cases, you, you get back the same answer as in the uncharged case. Now this identity I showed you before, there is something, so, so if you take the divergence of T here, of the S moment, you still have, you, know, so you, you get, an extra term here. So, so before you had the L without the F, so now we have the Liouville vector field depending on F, so it has this vertical part. And if you put this in, then you get here a term involving the momentum with a lower S. Okay, and this is also easy to, I mean, the easiest way to prove, you can use again Gauss theorem, then it's immediate, or you can just, it's an exercise again, so, so you just, take the previous identity and substitute L is LF minus V, and then you work on the V part and you, you will show that it will give rise to this, this term here. Um, okay, and now, so uh, as before, if you have no collisions, then you get the, the Vlasov equation now is modified by, by this term here. Now the current density is still zero because if S is one, then this term goes away. So this is, you still have the conserved number of particles. However, the stress energy tensor now is not divergence free. So you get this extra terms that comes from here. And that may worry you that something is, is wrong, but actually um, it, it is not. And uh, uh, to explain this, we can even generalize a little bit more. So let's let's let us have now. Let us consider the gas that consists of different species, say ions and electrons. So you would have two species in this case. Uh, I mean, one of positively charged particles or the negatively charged particles. Each one is characterized by its distribution function, which is defined on a different mass shell. Um, so each one, each distribution function will satisfy, if they're collisionless, the, the, the Vlasov equation, have, will have its Vlasov equation associated to it, but they will propagate in the electromagnetic field that is common to them. Um, and now, again, if you want to look at the problem in a self-consistent way, so this F is not given to you, but F the electromagnetic field is actually generated by the movement of these charges. So, so F should satisfy the Maxwell equation. So we have the homogeneous and the inhomogeneous Maxwell equation. And here, the current that appears as electric current is given by the sum. So Q is a charge of each species and J is the particle current density. So Q times G is the electric current of species A. So the total electric current is the sum of all this. And now, uh, this is the last exercise for today. So uh, when you compute the electromag, I mean the, the energy momentum stress tensor, then it, it is a sum of the individual energy momentum stress tensors of each species, but also you should add to it the electromagnetic uh, energy momentum stress tensor. Okay, which is given by this expression here. And now what you can show is that actually the total energy momentum stress tensor is there is free. Okay, so not, not the individual ones, but the total one is free. Okay, and that physically makes sense because energy can be exchanged between the, the charges and the electromagnetic field. Okay, so at the end, everything goes fine. You have to be careful with the signs so that everything cancels out. 
and this is the the Vlasov. The well, I don't know. Should I just call it Vlasov Maxwell or Maxwell Vlasov system? <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, so that's everything I want to say for 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 today, and we'll continue. And so, so on on um, on Thursday, uh, I will focus into two specific uh, applications I've been working on. Uh, uh, one is related to the solution of the Vlasov equation on a fixed black hole background. So they will exploit uh, some of the geometry we have learned today to introduce action angle variables, uh, which can be done also in a quite geometric way. Um, and in part four, uh, I hope that I will have some time to, to discuss what happens. I mean, what changes if you have collisions? <laughs> 